Welcome to Culture Plus Mindfulness, the final installment of the Norton Center's Culture Plus series. My name is Steve Hoffman, and I am the Executive Director of Center College's Norton Center for the Arts. Today, I am in Danville, Kentucky, on the ancestral lands of the Cherokee, Shawanaki, Shawnee, Yuchi, Adina, and Hopewell Nations. We are thrilled you have chosen to spend the next hour or so with our curated panel of thought leaders and artists who will share their stories and ideas related to mindfulness and culture. So thank you for joining us. The Culture Plus series is part of the Norton Center's Creative Conversations program, which is supported by an endowed gift by 1995 Center graduate, Dr. Jeff Johnson and Ken Michael. Now I'd like to introduce Molly Baker, the Norton Center Engagement Services Manager. Molly. Hi, everyone. Um, first, uh, just to echo Steve, thank you so much for being here tonight. We're really excited for tonight's program. Um, and before we jump in, I just have a couple little logistical things I wanted to mention. Um, so first, I want to inform you that you have a couple of viewing options. Um, if you select speaker view at the top of your screen, you'll find that the person who's actually speaking will be prominently featured on your screen. Um, if you choose gallery view, you'll be able to see multiple video feeds at the same time and you can cycle through the pages of, of videos. Um, but that being said, we've made sure that all of tonight's speakers and participants will be pinned to the first page. So if you want to see everyone at once, um, you could do that with the gallery view. Finally, I, I want to thank Joanna Huffman, tonight's ASL interpreter, for being here with us. Um, if you find her services will be useful for you, be sure to select the gallery view option and pin her window. Um, the other thing I want to mention is you've noticed, you'll probably have noticed that you've been muted, um, but you can still participate in a Q&A session that will probably happen at the end of tonight's conversation. If you'd like to ask a question, simply type it into the chat and direct it to Matt Overing. He'll make sure to field your questions to Aaron Godlaski, tonight's moderator, and we'll do our best to answer them all. Um, if for some reason not everything is answered, we'll do our best to follow up with you later. So with that, I will turn things back over to Steve. Great, thank you, Molly. And, and thanks to the entire Norton Center staff for making this program happen. I'd like to really truly recognize the entire Norton Center team for all of their hard work this year related to both this series and all of the, I'm using air quotes, other duties as assigned as a result of the pandemic. So if everyone could please help me thank Molly Baker, Dana Bart, Jennifer Broadwater, Amy Connell, Megan DeRugio, Jessica Durham, Michael Lavin, Matt Overing, and Nina Story. Your hard work is evident and incredible and an important part of the story of Center College successfully navigating these difficult and highly unusual times. And I really just want to express my personal thanks to you. Now, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Center College's president, Dr. Milton Moreland, for an official welcome. President Moreland, you have found time to welcome the Norton Center audience for every Culture Plus program this year. Thank you so much for your ongoing support of cultural programs in our community and on campus, especially now. Thank you, Steve. And again, thank you to all of the Norton Center staff. Everybody at Center College appreciates the work you've been doing. The Norton Center has kept us going in so many ways over this pandemic, not just through these programs, but the staff has been actively involved in almost every aspect of running the college, helping us get through the pandemic, helping our students, helping our staff, helping our faculty. So much appreciation for all you've done this, this entire year. I think these programs have been incredible and I hope there's a way to continue to have some of these um, programs broadcast because there's a just a wide variety of alumni and friends of the college and others, friends of the Norton Center who have been able to tune in and see some of our amazing faculty, our amazing friends, artists, performers, um, and a lot of alumni have joined these calls um, as panelists and speakers. So really grateful for the, the amazing groups that you've brought together for these um, programs. Happy to have another faculty member moderating tonight. As an associate professor in the behavioral sciences and psychology programs at Center College, a clinical psychologist, meditation teacher, and a middle child, 
Aaron Godlasky has been attempting to get the people around him to pay more attention for most of his life. Attracted to mindfulness through philosophical and cultural interests early on and through his later training as a therapist, he has an extensive history of trying very hard to sit still and failing, sitting still and failing. Thankfully, that act of voluntarily bringing back and cultivating focused attention and waking up to the present moment is at the very core of what it means to be mindful. Whether through teaching students to breathe, going on a silent retreat with monks of various persuasions, walking in the woods, or even brushing his teeth, Aaron believes we could all benefit from more closely examining what exactly it is that we are doing when we are doing what we are doing. So with that, I welcome you to this incredible program and turn it over to Professor Aaron Godlasky. Well, Milton, thank you so much for the very kind introduction uh, and welcome all of you to the latest edition of the Culture Plus program produced by the Norton Center for the Arts here at Center College. Um, tonight, it is culture plus mindfulness. What is it that makes our panelists experts in mindfulness, you might ask? I think in my experience and knowing some of them for some years now, getting to know some of them uh, uh, during the pandemic and meeting some of them for the first time is that they're all authentically and openly embracing life as it manifests itself to them really being who they need to be, and I think also who the world needs them to be. And I believe that you're going to see this as we share this time together this evening. So let me begin by introducing our panel. Our first panelist, I remember well from her time here as a student uh, at Center, uh, Ty Cespedes, who's the class of 2015. Ty is a native of Boston, Massachusetts. She's a dancer, a choreographer, and educator whose hip hop and jazz funk stylings have allowed her to teach and connect with audiences large and small, uh, whether it may be in after school programs and expressive and dance movement therapies, uh, or her current choreography that has been featured um, in shows at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. My second panelist or second panelist tonight is David Parks. He is also a graduate of Center College. Um, David is a Roshi, which is a term for an old or learned teacher. Um, and he's the director of uh, Bluegrass Zen, which is centered in Waco, Kentucky, near Richmond. Um, and he in, uh, has sitting groups uh, in Lexington and Berea as well. Uh, but of course, during the pandemic, uh, because there hasn't really been the opportunity to meet much in person, David has been branching out and teaching virtually uh, for a community of Zen practitioners from around the world uh, as part of his work with the Pacific Zen Institute. Uh, with whom he's been teaching for many years. Uh, he spent many years also before that as a minister of the United Church of Christ before devoting uh, full-time his attention to teaching Zen with the Pacific Zen Institute. He's got about 30 years or over 30 years of experience in accompanying others along life's path. He has a deep trust of life's generosity and sees Cohen practice, which he may talk a little bit more about here in a bit in its relation to mindfulness, as a vehicle for transformation and opening the hearts and minds uh, of others to the intimate experience of life lived both freely and fully. And then our final panelist this evening, Stefan Harris, is a musician, educator, and app developer, probably one of the most important contemporary voices in jazz music today. He plays vibraphone and marimba, among other instruments. He's also currently Associate Dean and Director of Jazz Arts at the Manhattan School of Music, He's also previously taught at Rutgers University and at NYU. And beyond his nine studio albums, Stefan also sees jazz as, I think, fundamentally relational, a vehicle for helping people to approach the uncertain and the unknown from a place of openness and empathy. And so please join me in welcoming our panelists tonight. We're going to be talking about mindfulness and culture. Uh, you know, I think there are many ways in which you can approach the conversation. Uh, about mindfulness and taking, uh, uh, I guess, a note from the improvisational nature of the work that all of our panelists do, whether it's through Zen practice, through dance, through jazz, I thought we would take kind of an approach of keeping things open and improvisational and looking at some ideas that emerge 
within the concept or around the concept of mindfulness, uh, and then just sort of speaking freely about that uh, as a group. And so I hope you enjoy that process. And um, you know, I'm excited to see what happens. I hope you are uh, as well. So to get things started, you know, one of the core ideas in mindfulness is the concept of acceptance and non-judgment. And so I thought, why don't we start with you, Ty? Um, how do you see acceptance and non-judgment manifesting for you uh, in dance and in the work that you do? So right now I'm working with a family. I work with twins who are six years old. I nanny for a time as well as teach dance. Um, I'm also a performer, so I'm always trying to improve my craft. I'm always learning. And I think for me, as a 28-year-old professional dancer and educator, I have to be super non-judgmental of myself and where I'm at any given day, like with how much experience and knowledge I have compared with how much I don't have. <laughs> um, just kind of holding those in, in my self and then being able to share authentically like what I know, what I don't know, and allowing that to inspire the people who I work with, whether they're the adults or the children who I teach dance to, or the kids who I'm, you know, au pairing for. <laughs> um, I think I learn a lot of valuable lessons in kind of stepping away from the expectation of an adult in a lot of these situations and simply accepting where everyone's at because sometimes kids can illuminate things that adults would never be able to see and accept um, with our lens you know um that's been informed over so many years with so much criticism right so kind of backing away from the inner critic is huge for me personally, yeah. So get really kind of creating an openness or an open space to experience uh, and learn from one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Aaron, I'll chime in here. It's, it's uh, you know, acceptance is, it's so incredibly difficult, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we constantly are questioning everything that we do until we reach a space where we understand that we're all a fundamental part of the fabric which makes us whole as a species that ultimately it's not about accepting what it is that i do or what my ability is it's about finding the right context for my ability to fulfill its bigger purpose and i find an improvisation it's been one of the greatest lessons i've learned over the years it's this notion that if you can hit the most theoretically incorrect note but what happens is other great musicians around you hear that they're surprised by it and it sparks their imagination. So if you're caught in your own ego and what you think is correct, you can oftentimes miss the, the beautiful ripple effect that your presence is creating for others. Right. So fundamentally, as an improviser, I try hard. I mean, we all struggle with it, but whatever comes out in that moment, I do the best that I possibly can not to judge it, because as soon as that ego kicks in, I get trapped in the past mm -hmm. and I'm no longer aware of what's happening around me in the moment. And life, the community of, of musicians who are on stage together are constantly creating a plethora of beautiful ideas that I can learn and grow from. If only I can quiet the ego and realize that my idea is not about me. <laughs> it's about putting something out there, allowing it to take run its course, allowing other people to interact with it. I observe how they interact with it. When it comes back to me, my ideas is made whole by other people's interaction with it, not by me. Right? So it's a difficult challenge. And I think, as I said a moment ago, it really is one of the most beautiful lessons that I've learned from being a part of the world of the arts, particularly in improvisation. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, you know, when you said that on Tuesday, Stefan, I was really, um, uh, it really, it really struck deep for me. Um, <clears throat> because really what you're describing is the improvisation that is our life. Uh, 
<laughs> you know, and, and the call that comes to us, you know, from the universe, the call is coming and you don't know what's coming. And then if, if you stick inside yourself and your idea of what it's supposed to be, um, you'll miss it. If your heart is opened, um, you'll be there. And, and then you can make your response out of the open heart. And, and so this, so you can't, you know, one thing that we teach um, is when we talk about meditation um, is you can't do it wrong. And I, Stefan, I think, I think that's exactly the, the same sort of thing that you say, you can't do it wrong. It's just part of the flow. It's part of what's happening in life and you get to respond. And if you respond out of, out of a, a, set, a set idea, you may miss it altogether. That's right. Oh. There's, there's a beautiful inevitability in all of us, right? I mean, I think about Ty's spirit alone before she moves at all. She, she lights up the room. And it, it's, it would be no surprise to me that she would do the same in her movement. But my guess is it's something that's generated from, from a place that's deeper than the physical movement and it's being manifested in the, in the movement. But that idea that you really don't have a choice, right? I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. it, it's, it's even hard. right here. What am I going to say? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that in my improvisation, like freestyling my dance, freestyle is such a fundamental part of ex exploring a lot of the foundations of the techniques that we use. And people are more comfortable learning a difficult technique that is so foreign to their body than expressing the movement that comes naturally to them. <laughs> but then, you know, thinking, because really it's their inner critic holding them back from simply letting go. They're thinking about what is this going to look like? Because I don't even know. <laughs> and what are people going to think about that? And really it's, not irrelevant, but I think that it is each person's own struggle with that, that they need to, you know, mm -hmm. worry about or have or, you know, be empowered to do on their own. And I think that a huge part of that is seeing other people do that Absolutely. and seeing it is normal and it's not just a fad. <laughs> makes me think of you know when you say the, the call from the unknown and i think about any time my phone rings and it says unknown caller <laughs> the unknown is calling and, and immediately the mind you know the mind jumps to judgment and you know it's like oh it's a telemarketer oh it's somebody trying to sell me something or it's a spam call um you know and that that idea of that like you know ty like you're saying you know what's going to emerge and can i accept that as it emerges in a way that doesn't judge, because there's this inner judgment that can impede that, right? and, and you know that process. And so, part of that letting go or letting be is really important, and maybe fundamental to being really present uh, 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 in that moment. Which you know leads me to you know my this next idea. You know, one of the probably the most common things or ideas that's uh, tied with mindfulness or connected to mindfulness in um, uh, in, in popular culture and its presentation is being in the present moment, right? finding ways to be in the present moment. And uh, so anybody can uh, dive in with this one, but how do you get into the present? Uh, and, and what is the importance of the present moments uh, for you in, in what you do? I'll share oh. a secret. <laughs> I am doing this actively every time I get super excited about something that someone says, because me, I'm the kind of person that repeats it in my head. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna remember that. But then two minutes later, I'm like, oh wait, what are they talking about? <laughs> so actively, I think every moment is an opportunity to regain presence and you know, find the immediacy. That is not necessarily urgency um, because that can, inspire anxiety, but really just what it is, accepting whatever is happening for what it is and without emotion. And I think our emotional intelligence is really great and exciting, but 
you know, the calmness that comes from, I don't want to say detaching yourself from your emotions, but being their loving, caring observer and owner, you know, like a, like a parent um, of sorts who kind of just let their kid do what they want with minimal redirection. That's where it's at. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I, for me, it's, 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 I, I'm able to stay in the moment through a, a type of hyper focus. It really is about perception. There are so many layers to a given moment. There are levels to it, right? So many times if I find that I'm concerned about the past or something that may or may not happen tomorrow, I'm generally just perceiving a superficial level of what's in front of me. I feel most alive, however, when I'm in a deep state of focus and I actually get lost, that's that's when I really feel <laughs> amazing, right? Rather, it could be doing a puzzle, right? But whatever it is, particularly around music, because improvisation and, and jazz in particular, it's it's not something that you do, you live it. It's a, it's a practice, right? So getting into that type of space definitely takes effort and it takes time. But the more you focus on being able to deeply perceive as many levels of what's happening right in front of you, the easier it gets, honestly, over time. And you begin to carry it with you into every other situation, even when you meet someone for the first time. I think over the years of being an improviser, I've learned how to be more perceptive about how other human beings feel. It's definitely has made me more empathetic and perceptive. And in the long run, that type of hyper focus on the present has made me much more effective in everything that it is that I'm going to do, even as it pertains to the projected future. Mm -hmm. right? How am I going to be so, successful in the future? It's really about understanding how to perceive what's happening right now. So, so here we might give a shout out to meditation. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Please do. <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, the, um, you know, mindfulness is mindfulness meditation, right? And it's derived out of um, techniques that came from India and China and Japan. Uh, and there's a real interesting koan uh, that kind of, uh, that'll be helpful. Now a koan, I probably should say what a koan is before yes. I give one. <laughs> it's a, a koan is a gateway into the present. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, the koan itself uh, participates in and invites one into a uh, mystery, into life, in, into this sea that we find ourselves in that, that is so large that we can't hold it. And it invites us to be in there and, and truly to discover who we are. I mean, it, it's that deep. Um, uh, and, and it has something to do with like uh, both Stefan and Ty, you know, the stepping outside of ourselves, um, uh, having emotions, not becoming emotions, you know, mm -hmm. noticing, you know, the acceptance that, that drops down deep, you know, there's, there's that uh, story about turtles all the way down. Well, it's acceptance all the way down. Mm -hmm acceptance all the way down. And, and the koan is uh, something that we bring into our lives in order to, um, to begin to, to tap into that. Um, so here's the koan I was gonna give you. Uh, this is from Zhao Zhou. He, he was uh, Tang, Tang Dynasty, China, 800, something like that. And the student comes up to him and says, what is meditation? And he says, not meditation. <laughs> so he, he, he takes the rug right out from under uh, the student. And then the student's confused and say, well, what are we doing all that? Well, what is it? What, what is it? And he says, it's alive. It's alive. And um, this life is, is going on all around us all the time. And just like Stefan said, sometimes we're think we're worrying, sometimes we're, we have our regrets, uh, but this life calls us to this moment right here and, and to explore and to discover uh, what, what, is, what is here. And, um, and, and so what is meditation? Well, anything, 
dance, mm -hmm. playing, making bread, feeding the dog, um, any place where you shine this light here. And, you know, you go in and, and, um, uh, and, and just begin to notice, you know, what, what's here in this moment? What's here? What's here right now? And, um, and get ready to be surprised because it's not what you think. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so. Turtles, um, right? Yeah, yeah, it's turtles. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what a beautiful gift to oneself to take that time, but it's also an incredible gift to others. I, I always hmm. think of the highest manifestation of love being empathy and that to, to truly love someone, you have to understand it has nothing to do with you. <laughs> to really love someone is to see that human being for hmm. who they are. It has nothing to do what it, with what you're trying to get out of the relationship. It's <laughs> about just stepping back and allowing that person to understand that you see them. But that is an effort. I, I think of love as a form of meditation also. So it's in my mind, it's not always about sitting still and going inward. It's about mm -hmm. active meditation and how I'm interacting with my wife and my children and people that I meet day to day. That's all a form of a living meditation in my mind. Mm -hmm. I love that. So I have a question from uh, a question from the audience that I think relates specifically to this. So I'm going to I'm going to pepper this in here. Um, and this is one that I commonly get that I've gotten from, from, from clients, from students, from, from people that I've taught in the past. So I think it's, it's, it's one that lots of people have. And uh, the question says, how do you uh, really realize that you're, if you're so focused on work or family or your day, that you notice that you're not being present? Um, and yeah, how, how do you get into that? How do you get into that space? Um, you know, when, when, how, what, in what ways maybe do you find yourselves catching yourselves or what's a giveaway uh, in your own experience when you're stepping out of that moment? We're talking about being in it, but what about when we're not in it? And then maybe how do we then get into it? <laughs> so for example, maybe like right now, <laughs> I am a little bit nervous. I'm always like, okay, Ty, you're not thinking about what you're gonna say, you're listening. Right. And <laughs> being so enthralled with everything that you guys are sharing right now. And then immediately like going back into my self credit. Oh man, now you have to like, no, I'm right now as we speak deeply breathing into my pelvis and just kind of like, allowing myself to feel the truth of what you all have said in my body and letting it resonate and letting whatever response comes out just flow non-judgmentally and just that that's what I'm actively doing because I actually live with social anxiety I'm clinically diagnosed social anxiety so so for you, it's about really grounding. Absolutely. I use about it. getting back in touch with your immediate experience and, and breath is a way to do that because, you know, because as, long, as long as you're breathing, there's more right with you than <laughs> wrong with you. And, you know, it your breath pumps follows, the blood where it needs to go. <laughs> follows you around everywhere you go. Right out so. of the big old brain <laughs> and then into my body. That's actually here that you can see, not my mind or wherever you want to astrally project or, you know, wherever your mind goes that's not it <laughs> yeah. it's it's funny I've, I've been i've often been asked a similar question about balance because i'm in you know i'm an educator i'm developing apps i'm, I'm just involved in a lot of different things at the same time and my general res response is that i feel like that question is a form of judgment that i would be putting on myself if i were seeking balance <laughs> Actually, I'm not seeking balance. What I'm doing is I'm deeply engaged in what I'm doing in that moment. So when I am working, I am as focused as I possibly could be. But then when I'm playing soccer with my, my, my eight-year-old, I'm equally as focused in that space. But I don't have to apologize to myself for the focus that I had when I was working. I accept it. The balance that uh, 
that is correct, so to speak, is the one that is revealed to me. It's where, where I find, it's, it's almost like some people say, you shouldn't look at the world to, for their opinion. Actually, I, I kind of look at, well, if you put an idea out there, it is about how it is received. <laughs> Your idea is only effective if it actually reaches the people that you're trying to reach. So for me, I, I'm definitely big on putting things out into the world, being deeply engaged, and then paying attention to the results that I'm getting. So if I'm getting the type of growth and spiritual fulfillment and love and compassion from my family, then that's the, that balance is correct. But I can definitely sense when something is out of balance, right? Because you can feel it, not just inside yourself, but you can feel it in the results you're getting from other people. You can feel that you're not having a positive impact in the lives of others. So I don't seek a pre conceived notion of balance, I really am much more intuitive in terms of the way that I try to move through the world. And I try to feel what is the correct balance for that moment, which of course may change three days later. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really yeah. important to scan your environment and take into account your immediate surroundings as well. Because, yeah, literally your balance could be off because you're just looking at, you know, that one piece. But if you just broaden that outlook, you realize, oh, well, you know, this is happening, which affects this. And it's not internal. It's not my internal world out of balance. It's where I'm at. I'm, I need to re, re uproot myself, replant myself and continue to do what I'm doing. But <laughs> maybe... So uh, acceptance all the way down. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I keep chickens. Uh, you know, Aaron, you've been out to my place. And uh, when I start acting like the chickens <laughs> running around, I, I, I know, oh, oh, okay. Not paying attention. Okay. And, 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 you can pay attention to that. So, so the very thing that you think is, is, oh, this is a problem. Well, it's no problem. It's, it's actually a gateway into your life. Well, what's your life right now? Well, I'm running around like my chickens. <laughs> and, and, and that piece of acceptance, that acceptance, there you go. You know, it is what it is. And uh, you're, you're in that place, you're in, um, you, you've turned the light in. Um, so already you're meditating, already you're present uh, by noticing that you're not present. And so, you know, that's okay. And so one thing I do for myself is like, oh, look what David's doing now. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it's, that's, a, that's just a, a nice little practice point. Oh, yeah, David does that sometimes. Yeah, I've, I've caught him doing that before. And, um, and it just, and, and the other thing I think that helps is, um, is uh, having a, some kind of daily practice. And it doesn't necessarily have to be sitting meditation, though, um, you know, I'd advocate for that, I suppose. But um, it could be, you know, gardening. Or whatever, but but paying attention, um, having a time of the day when you, it's unambiguous what you're doing, and maybe that's what sitting meditation is. It's a, an unambiguous time. You know, you could pay attention to your life in any moment at any time of day, but when we sit in meditation, uh, you're not baking bread at the same time. You're not washing the dishes. You're not talking to your spouse. You're just, it's a just sitting. Zazen is just sitting. And then you get to, <laughs> then you get to sit with yourself <laughs> and notice even when I think I'm paying attention, oh, not so much, <laughs> but not judging, not judging that, just saying, oh, okay, okay. Um, acceptance all the way down. And there are those times, I think, too, where we, you know, we may find ourselves in that space, right? And the recognition that like, oh, I, I am, I am judging right now, or, yeah. or I am, you know, in the future or the past. And, and again, being willing to accept, you know, that space. Yeah. And so it's not about maybe suppressing, 
those experiences or trying to get away from them. I remember one of the first uh, books that I read on mindfulness you know, years ago, uh, it was uh, um, Thich Nhat Hanh's um, Miracle of Mindfulness, a little short kind of thin volume on, on, on meditation practice. And there's a story in there about a guy who's talking about being busy and having to spend lots of time taking care of his children and being at work and, and, and doing like, you know, washing dishes and all these activities that get in the way of his being in the present. And, uh, you know, Han's answer to him is all these moments are, <laughs> are, are your life. You know, it's not that you don't have time for your life because you have all these other things. These are your life. And can yeah. you embrace those? Yeah. And you're not having the wrong life. <laughs> right and wrong, right? Yeah, and you're right, right you're not wrong. even having the right life. It's just <laughs> this life. It's this life. Yeah. Yeah. So let me uh let me ask you all another ask you all another question or, or, or play another note and we'll see what comes out. Um what about embodiment? Uh, uh, maybe Stefan, maybe you can lead with this one. I, I've been watching you perform, you know, videos of you performing for the, you know, the last week or two. And, you know, you are a physical player. You engage, you know, physically, not just with your instrument, but with the people around you as you play. So can you talk about embodiment uh, uh, in, in, in jazz and, and what you do? Uh, it's, it's, what a great term, embodiment, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> um, but it's something that is a real privilege, it's a real honor when you can find yourself in the space where you really are full of whatever it is you're aspiring to do. And, and I keep going back to this notion of losing yourself. Uh, I can tell you it's difficult to explain, but when you work on your ears for many, many years in music and your, your level of perception grows, you, you literally know what the next note is. It's not really a decision. <laughs> it's really that you're just perceiving. You walk into a space, you can hear the drummer is doing something with the cymbal, and all of a sudden, the pianist started to do something really low, and it created this grumble and this sparkle, and then they started to move towards each other. And you can, you can literally see this happening. The sound is getting lower on the drums, it's getting higher on the piano, and right before it meets, you can see like, bam, you're supposed to play that note that ties those two things together. It's not even a decision, right? So it's like you, you literally become a vehicle for the music to express itself, but it takes a long time. Not, there's of course the physical part, the mechanics and the science of music, but it takes a long time to quiet the ego so that you can accept that all is all that's necessary in this moment is bam right at the right moment and it's and sometimes it's it's interesting with music because it's not only relative to other human beings it's i mean music is just a series of vibrations right <laughs> that have tendencies to go to the left and to the right really great musicians can sense on a deep level where a chord wants to go but even when you're if you're playing music by yourself it's like i could I could take a single note right like just hearing that one note the way that it played I didn't decide in advance what was going to happen but it resonated in a very nice open way and actually it sounds different to my ear now <laughs> right it had a little bit more of a let's see let's see Let's see. Oh, see, I'll play it a different way. Watch this. Oh, see, this needs this. It needs this. Hmm. That embodiment. Yeah. tell you like right now I hear I hear this and then something a little heavy hearted here oh, then a little sparkle <laughs> it's not that I'm deciding it though it's like I play it 
and and I think you're all feeling it. The best musicians, they have a strong sense of what you feel. They're very perceptive of where the audience is and what brings the audience gratification is you're delivering what it is that they're feeling, but it takes a long time. That to me, at its highest level is embodiment. When you lose the ego, you lose the self, and you're literally of service. The chord wanted to sparkle. I've studied for many years. I'm still studying every day. It's, it's hard. I work as hard as I can so that I can find, I can access in my memory which chords sparkle because the music needs a sparkle right there. So that's that's how I think of embodiment. It takes a lot of work, but what a privilege. I would love to rip off that with the vibration, but even then, I wonder if <laughs> this has anything to do because the vibrations that come from the heart rhythms that we keep that are a lot of times based on our emotional state, uh, much like the brain emits the uh, elect electric. Um, so the way maybe our hearts are communicating with your heart in the way that you're being present, whether the audience is present or not, you're able to perceive and connect with your heart mm -hmm. and then emote those vibrations. And I just wonder if it's connected because it is so true that our hearts are always emitting these electrical impulses and that can be palpable to people who are perceptive. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, life, life is always called, it's life that we're having. Um, it's, it's really just one thing. It's just one thing. And, and often uh, we see ourselves as separate from this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what we do is we say, um, oh, um, I'm worried. Or, and, or, and then we start scheming and planning and trying to make things come out our way. <laughs> ego, ego is firmly in, in the driver's seat. And, and at that point, um, there's, there's no hearing, there's no listening. To what's coming in your direction, and 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 so you can't. I, I love what you said, Stefan, about uh, there's no choice. Well, you know, everybody would say, "Oh, there's no freedom there." That is freedom. That is freedom to to be in in the Tao, into the flow of what's right here is what makes us free we're in prison when we're, we're we're sitting here and say oh i think this should happen and it should go here 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 and <laughs> and, and it's based on you know some idea that we have about something and and we're trying to take the take the world and make it into something else right there's no freedom in that but the freedom the freedom to listen 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 and, and hear the call, right? The, the whole call and response, like, you know, in, in the black church, you know, the calls and responses that come and, and, um, and, and then you're in it. You're just there. And that's mindfulness. What is mindfulness? What, not mindfulness. Uh, what is it? It's alive. <laughs> yeah. And you're a part of that. It's funny. It's interesting to riff on choice. It's another one of those things. It's a complicated thing, but it's it's a little overrated, right? In terms of the ego, I mean, it's this thing that we all have a high value on, and I'm not belittling it, but I I think we would all have to accept that in the long run there is something that we are made of that we're we're designed to do. Yeah. And you're yeah. going to find so much life and, and, and joy and, and connectivity to the to the world when you're doing what you're supposed to do. Ultimately, I don't I'm not looking for a choice. I'm looking to be as authentic as I possibly can. I feel like my journey in life so far has been a series of revelations about the reality of who I am. That yeah. And, so yeah, and it's along the way sorry. that I predicted. <laughs> Ever since I was a child, I've been told a yeah. lot of bad things that yeah. I had to just keep, I heard it, and I had to keep looking inward and being perceptive and realizing, well, I can't help it. This is just who I am. And I didn't make a choice other than 
to stay true to what was coming out of me and yeah. watching what the world was giving me in return based on my actions. Yeah, you use the word supposed to, it's more intimate than that. And I think you said, I think you've said it too. It's just more intimate than that. It's just here I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here I am. For everyone. I mean, wow. Yeah. That's <laughs> that intuition. Improvisation. You actually get to live. And you know, I'm I'm not an elitist as an as an artist. Like I, I think art is only going to thrive when it's of value to society at large. Not that there are moments where someone feels that they have the luxury even of watching another artist express themselves. That's beautiful. But I actually would love more and more people to have art in their lives. They should be utilizing art themselves so that you can get into this space because so much of it is not about observing someone else it's experiential mm -hmm. and you don't, yeah. it's not about level it's not about you have to be the best in the world to do it it's more about being especially around improvisation it's about vulnerability and just letting go of judgment and, and improv is one of the best first steps towards letting go of judgment there, there's a there's a koan. I, I, I don't have it well memorized, but uh, somebody comes to a teacher and, and, and recites uh, a, uh, a poem. And, uh, and, and Yun Men, he says, aren't those someone else's words? <laughs> and, and he says, yes. And he says, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it, it, it all comes to just being here and being being who you are in this moment and and i will find the intimacy with life and with you and with my chickens and horse and friends and strangers you know i'll find myself there so abby like all of you have been you know in, in, in talking about this idea this this kind of an uh of making yourself available, making ourselves available to to music, to the beating of the heart, to our our work, our activities, to really be open to life and and letting it live us, right? You know, kind of as as, as it's been described. One of um one of the question that that, that, that came up a, a moment ago in the chat was, you know, how do I as an ordinary person improvise? Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to say, start right now. Yes. I want to say that some things that I do in my life to improvise because I love to freestyle everything is doing things differently from the most like minute task, like going to work. Sometimes I'll take the long route. I'll say, I'm going to leave 15 minutes early and take a way I've never gone before. And that brings me such peace and joy. Like it's un unreal, <laughs> the, the impact that freestyling the little things in your life can do for you. Interesting, right? Because that, to Ty's point, and I think David as well, it's, on the one hand, it's acceptance, but then there are actual there are actually actions that we can take to unlock our ability to accept, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. making the decision to let go and to take a different path and, and having, but that's a conscious decision. And there are all of these incredible exercises and meditations that people do that help them with that. I'll share with you one that I, I love to, to do uh, with my children and it's around food. <laughs> it's, we do this great, it's, it's, I suppose it would be called a meditation or not, right, David? <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I love for them to do, my, my kids are 12 and 8 now, and I love to have the food there. I say, before we eat, let's think about everything that had to happen to bring this food. Mm. <laughs> someone, like if there are strawberries there, someone had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to pick those strawberries, right? Someone had to plant them. Someone had to create the bag that it goes in. Someone had to get the oil and get the truck and someone had to push to open a store, right? And then someone had to go to the store. Someone had to print the money. There are all of these people involved with bringing that strawberry to you right now and taking a minute. And, and this is great. Like my eight year old loves this. They totally get it. And you let them talk through it. But they develop such appreciation and gratitude, not for the food, but for the connectivity with 
all of us around. But see, that's another one of those things where I don't know that I would just feel that. I don't know that my children would just feel that. But having techniques like that really open up the way that they see the world and helps them. It's really like an intentional action, like you're talking about, Tyler, taking an intentional activity with your family, Stefan, to, to really look at things in a way that you might not, you know, just automatically look at them. Mm -hmm. um, and, because and, automatic and, is like, you think about it, what is automatic? Who programmed this automation? <laughs> was it me? Because if it wasn't intentionally myself, I'm going to question it. I'm, you know, yeah. sorry, not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> any, any thoughts on ordinariness, David? Ordinary? Um, ordinariness or, 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 or improvisation <laughs> in the ordinary? Well, you know, uh, the, the, on, on Tuesday when we were going over this, I, I mentioned that koan that uh, goes, um, uh, let's see, a student comes to a teacher and the teacher says, where have you been? And he says, out on pilgrimage. And, um, and the teacher says, well, how's that been for you? And the student says, um, I don't know. And uh, the teacher says, not knowing is most intimate. And, and, uh, and, and intimate in, in Chinese characters uh, for intimate are the same as the characters for enlightenment. So it's, you know, feeling that intimacy with the world. Uh, empathy. I, I think you've um, talked about that too, Stefan. And, and, and your walk, that, that's a, a not knowing walk right you don't know you don't know what's going to come and and it's like uh we get to go through this life um and and if if we just do what we know that's pretty boring <laughs> but and and if 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 um we only think about those things that we're certain about that's pretty boring too <laughs> But if if we if we turn towards not knowing, if we say, um, okay, I'm going to take a I'll take a step in this direction. I've never done that before. Then we get to discover. We get we're exploring now, and and we get to see the landscape around us. We get to see um, how things are, and and you know we're, we're we enter that inner landscape, and we get to say, oh wow, you know I've never known that before, and and uh, um, and. And that's interesting, <laughs> you know, because because you 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 meet up with um, uh, you meet up with this the world you meet up with this thing that I've been calling life. You know, it's alive. You meet up with it, and you find out that you are it, and that there's no separation. Um, but if you're if you're if your head is full of knowing, you'll never get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because so that's, that's interesting. We're, we're all of us here teachers. Right? And so in some ways, we're sometimes considered as the, the subject that's supposed to know, right? We're, 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 we're the people who are supposed to know things. Um, and there's a question from somebody about okay. teaching um, and this idea of improvisation. So just in, in the ways that we've been talking, um, how, does, how does this way maybe open up your teaching? I'll tell you as a one one philosophy that I have as an educator is I, I don't buy into the empty vessel theory of mm -hmm. education. The idea that students come to us and they're this empty vessel and we're supposed to fill them with information. I I treat every single student as a fully realized human being. And my job is to simply give them the tools that they need to sing the truth about their world about their perception because their life experiences are different than mine. The value in them having the tools that they need to articulate the world that they see is that we all get to see those small bits that we otherwise wouldn't understand. You cannot understand the entire tapestry unless you can see all of the small parts. And again, this is where a lot of the value of arts education, I think, comes into play. It happens in other fields of study, but this notion of quantitative education versus qualitative. I think the arts really put you in a situation where we give you a hammer and we don't call it a hammer. It's like, here's this thing. What do you think it is? What are you going to do with it, <laughs> right? Then we'll put you in a situation 
and not tell you how to get out and let you sort of figure out, fight your way through it. And then after that, I'll start giving you examples of how masterful artists use that same tool. But first, I really want to allow you to discover, and that really is the ultimate lesson, is if, if I can put you on a path of perception and curiosity, then I feel like I've been successful in giving you the tools you need. Yeah, I, I think I want to take away, uh, I'm a Zen teacher, so yeah, I come to things backwards. <laughs> and, and, and I'd like to take, out, take away everything you know. Uh, and then, and then I'd, I'd like to, um, I'd like, I'd like you to say, okay, now be honest about your experience. What's here and show me what's here. Um, and, 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 you know, um, uh, you know, you know, what, um, so that, and then, okay. Uh, I've taken away everything you know, but you got to do stuff, right? <laughs> you you have to do things in the world, and and you have you have things that you need to do, and 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 your responses can are are out of your life, you know, out of things that you know. You can make responses to to the world. Like I can't play piano, Stefan can, so his responses are are from something that he knows and something that he learned, and um and and so we take our awakening. We take our awakening back into our lives, and uh, not and not not approaching our lives from a place of knowing, but of, of, out of that, approaching it from that place of not knowing, and using all the tools that we've ever learned. I went to Center College, you know. I forgot more than I remember from that, but um, uh, but <laughs> uh, but but that you know that my toolbox is filled with things from there. And uh, and elsewhere, you know, things I know, but but we're, we're so dependent on knowing in our culture, and uh, uh, there there's just needs to be more room for discovery and, and openness, openness to life, and uh, and seeing who we are, you know, that we're not who you're not who you think you are. Any of you, any of you, forty four people still in the room, <laughs> you're not who you think you are. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful place to be. Also to have fun with yourself because your ego is a huge part of yourself. We all work on it being a more balanced part of ourselves, right? Um, or finding that perfect, um, not comfort, but exchange of energies within ourselves um, and acceptance of everything that's going on within ourselves. Um, and I don't know where I was going, <laughs> but I feel like, yes, you can express yourself, even using your ego authentically in dance, for example, I'll give you this example, new dancers, we work on the very beginning, getting in touch with our bodies and embodying, you know, our authentic self, minus the ego, when we get to the combination that I've choreographed to share, we tap into that ego. We use it to express these emotions that not everyone in the room may have the experience to tap into. So it's really important to honor that ego and not develop a bad relationship with it as well, I think. I think we don't talk about that enough, but also, you know, no, that's great. Thank you all for those examples. So as I promised on Tuesday, I really, we, we're, we're kind of coming to the end here, but I do want to kind of close our structured discussion as, as structured as it's been, I guess, but with the idea of gratitude, humility, and love, mm. that's something that we really, we, we, uh, I want to make sure we, we take a moment to talk about. I think we've been touching on it in a lot of different subtle ways, you know, as we've gone, um, but any thoughts on gratitude, humility, love in practice, in work, in relation to being mindful, being present, showing up, not showing up? Mm. What, what do you think? Well, I, I, would, I would say that I have incredible gratitude for, for everyone here. 
right? I, I feel like this is what I need right now in this moment. As David said, you are not who you think you are. You are actually who I need you to be right now, <laughs> right? <laughs> the growth that I'm experiencing right now is because of you. So whether you realize that you are a participant in this beautiful game that's going on right now, it doesn't matter. You are. You're an improviser right now in this moment. Roberta Guthrie, you have you have been lighting up my heart this entire time. <sighs> Right, you didn't have to say a word. It may not have been your intention, but it's what I needed. Is it? Is it Shanti Oppenheimer? Man, the the when, when you came on with the dog. Oh my goodness! It was like that's exactly <laughs> what I needed. It opened up my spirit, and so it's it's a beautiful thing. I have gratitude for having the perception and and humility to pay attention and learn from every single one of you, and not knowing. I have no expectation when I came on the call and I walk away with what it is that I think my spirit needed. So I, I, I thank you all for just being generous and being here with us. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful as well. It's kind of nice to be, uh, though uh, uh, we're not at uh, Norton Center right now or <laughs> Newland Hall, uh, it, it's nice to come full circle and, um, and, and uh, be among center folk. And I'm appreciative of um, everyone who's here. And uh, um, I'm gonna, there's a, a, uh, a early 20th century, maybe late 19th century Carmelite uh, nun whose name was Elizabeth of the Trinity. And uh, she, um, she, she was dying of tuberculosis, but she was still going on retreats within the Car Carmel, within the monastery. And at this one, she, she uh, felt overwhelmingly the compulsion to tell her superior to let herself be loved. Let yourself be loved, she wrote. And in some ways, that's, that's exactly what we've been talking about. You know, let your life have you, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And and, uh, and and you and and you'll find oh you know your life that's my life let, <laughs> it's mine it's for me so let your life have you and and then um, and let love have you let yourself be loved and then return the love love your life and was it uh, from Bob Marley one love right there's just that. There's just that. So, uh, you know, this whole contemplative thing, this whole um, mindfulness thing, they won't, tell it, they, they, won't, they won't tell it to you at the hospital when, when you go to learn how to relax and lower your blood pressure. Um, so they teach you MBSR. But it, let me tell you, because I've been in religion for a long time now, <laughs> um, it's all about love. It's only about love. Yeah. And that's all we are. So thank you. What, what, else, what else can be said? Yeah. I think I want to piggyback off of that. And I shared something controversial on Tuesday that I think I want to share with this group of people. There, Go ahead. This audience is making me feel so comfortable to share that I believe that, yes, we are love. If you believe that God is love and you believe that you have that inside of you, then you can call upon that whenever you want you don't need to be in a specific place you don't need to be free of sin or you know whatever call to judgment um idea of that you have you only need to realize that you are it you know you have god within you if you believe in a god right and if you don't, you have the universe within you. Your genetic makeup is that of the greatest thing that we know of in existence. So just imagining that, I think it's pretty amazing and incredible. And everyone who I meet, I give that, yeah? Like that energy, 
And I think people really appreciate that and resonate with it because it is on their frequency, whether they know it or not, you know, mm -hmm. whether they're tapped in or not. But the, everyone can recognize that it's beautiful to witness. But I think it's more about accepting that it is in your power to actualize that in your life mm -hmm. and become actualized in that same way as a human being. Yeah. To really fully like be in that you know, space, like to cultivate within ourselves a sense of mindfulness, a sense of gratitude, humility, ultimately love. And, you know, like you said, what for? To give it away. It's not for ourselves. <laughs> it's, for, it's, it's, for, it's for everything else and everyone else. Um, so I, 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 I see Steve has, has re-entered uh, the image here. That's probably my, my, my minute warning. Um, for those of you that would like to, to stick around, I think Stefan has uh, uh, it's, it's, it's got a short video. It's going to kind of play us out uh, a bit. So we may play that. Um, but uh, let me, before that, let me thank everyone. Uh, Ty, thank you so much for being here. Savan, thank you so much for being here. David, thank you so much for being here. It's been a wonderful evening. I hope the audience has enjoyed it uh, as much as I have uh, and that we've you know, all had a chance to be mindful you know, in this space and, and connect. So thank you so much um, for your presence and, and your attention. Thank you. Stefan, before we switch to see your video, I just wanted to say a few words. And first, if anyone is like me, I have been sitting in it first as, as, as you all started your conversation, it was so frustrating not to be able to be part of it, to, to join in and to ask questions and to respond. And when you think about live theater or live art, you know, th there's that energy that you share with the audience and the artist and that synergy, um, but it was there. And it actually became quite liberating to be able to uh, just listen and take in everything you were doing and feel it. And Ty, your energy truly is, is beautiful. I mean, you, you really exude ever since, you know, I've, I've known you since you were a student and you worked at the Norton Center. Um, you hopefully, you, you might have even worked with uh, the performance when Stefan had performed at the Norton Center. We don't know. Uh, but, <laughs> But I, I just want to thank you all, our esteemed panelists, for sharing your stories, your insights, and your art with us. Uh, Ty, David, Stefan, Aaron, the, the honor was truly ours. And I, I want to take a pause. This is our final perform, uh, program in this uh, virtual pandemic series. And I, it's, it's important to thank you, our loyal patrons, who have supported this virtual series. And while this series has been very different in format, to say the least, you continue to show your support for new and adventurous programs and ideas, and you truly are tastemakers. And we can't wait to get next season launched and let people know what's gonna be coming and be ready for, to open the doors and all the seats behind me be filled with everyone uh, together as a community and experiencing at the same place with that synergy. So that'll be on its way. The koans that David was mentioning and the music of Stefan, Ty, some, the movement, we, we will be providing each of you in the audience with your own um, toolbox, a toolkit of these different experiences that connect with mindfulness that have been provided by our panelists and some other ideas that we can send you. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And once again, thank you all for supporting the Norton Center. And what a great way if we could, uh, Stefan, if we could uh, hear a little bit of your, your music and see it, that would just be a great way to end the program. Oh, it would be my pleasure. Uh, I, I was sitting here and I, I was thinking, about one story that I wanted to share. It was something that I've come across recently that I think is, it's been incredibly valuable in my life. So I wanted to share that with you. It's a Sufi story and it's, it's called To Catch a Monkey. <laughs> it's great. And it's, apparently this, is, this really happens. Uh, so the way that you, you catch a monkey is you, you take a, a vase that has a very thin opening, just thin enough for the monkey to stick his arm into it. 
and you put an apple in there and you hang the vase upside down and sure enough the monkey comes along sees the apple sticks its arm inside the apple grabs a hold of the monkey the object of its desire and then he can't get his arm out because he's holding on to that apple <laughs> right so he's actually trapping himself because he's obsessed with this one way of thinking whereas if he would just let go there would probably be a hundred ways to get to that apple so that's a, a a brief version of that story but i i found that to be incredibly transformative as an improviser and as as a human being so i wanted to share that uh, this song that I'm going to play for you uh, is a video that we, my band put together just a few months ago during the uh, pandemic. It's a beautiful song called Now, written by one of my mentors, the great Bobby Hutcherson. And what I like about this, this video is the melody is really, really simple. If you looked at what this was on a piece of paper, it literally just looks like this on paper. It just goes... That's literally what's written. So we take this simple melody that's repeated. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. We don't know how many times it's going to happen. We don't know who's going to start, right? So you'll see that we are deeply connected as a community, as a team. We're listening, the symbols are responding, and we are coming together to create something of beauty. It's about an eight minute video. So thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy this. This is, uh, uh, my band Blackout, and this is a piece called Now. Let's see here. Time when love was to be At the end, love was me
Thank you, everyone. Thanks for allowing me to share. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I like these reactions. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So that just happened. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of the joys of music of improv. Yeah. It's just a, it's like an eight bar phrase that's written in. Mm. <laughs> just lovely, just lovely. Just yeah. let it happen. You challenge each other, and you, you know, you let the mis the so called mistakes flow, and <laughs> you capitalize on them. Yeah. Well, I have a feeling I'm going to rewatch this video several times. There were so many bits of information to glean from it and, and revisit. And you are all welcome to shortly within a week, we'll have this posted on our website, along with some resources about our panelists and um, other materials. So we, we really thank you for being part of this program. What a great way to end a series. Um, what, what a great way to kind of watch the, the year plus of the pandemic go on and, and take a, a different step forward. So thank you, everyone. We really appreciate your being here and part of this. Good night. Take care. Good night.